Ice, thanks for being with us again. And we'll pick up where we left off from last week. And that is uh, talking about the various worldviews ruling the world. And I promised you this week I would talk to you about a little bit more about communism. And to do that, we need to understand, first of all, the one of the greatest tools that has been used by the communists since the, at least the 1930s has been the information operation. We talked about how the Frankfurt School came to America in 1933 at the invitation of John Dewey, the father of modern education, dropped these intellectual Marxists from Germany down at Brandeis and Berkeley and Princeton and other places and set out to have a cultural revolution. Political correctness is what they called it. It was really cultural Marxism, but they couldn't call it that, so they called it political correctness. And so at least since the 1930s, there's been an information operation going on. Now, by that, that phrase, information operation, may be new to some of you. If you are military or former military, information operation is not a new word to you or phrase to you at all. The military often uses information operations, uh, and they can be used in a good way or a bad way. And many times the military uses them in a positive way to try to gain the hearts and minds of people in nations that we have gone into to do work. Maybe, for instance, we go into um, somewhere like Iraq and we try to stabilize that region uh, after Saddam Hussein with an information operation, trying to get them to elect their own people and to uh, really put into place some uh, rules and some policies and laws that foster more liberty and freedom. Uh, Certainly, if the day ever comes when we can uh, uh, take over Cuba or eliminate the Castro regime in Cuba, an information operation will be required in order to try to educate people uh, on what is true, what is honorable, the purpose of government. They have had generations of brainwashing in communism. So we would have to have an information operation to explain to them what it looks like to be a liberated and free people. And so the military uses what they call information operations. And again, they can be used for good or they can be used for ill. Well, in America, information operations is also known as a propaganda war or a false narrative. It often seeks to appeal to people's emotions and not facts or reason or logic or context. And most Americans, without knowing it, have been the victims of this propaganda war in America. The promotion of the idea of pluralism, which is not again the study of multiple cultures, but a denigration of the foundational Western worldview, biblical Christianity. Uh, it has included feminism that is not about equal rights for women, but anti-family, anti-father. It has polluted the idea of tolerance, which is really to say that anything promoted from an absolute standpoint is intolerance. And so that kind of information has gone on for a very, very long time. The, the, the Muslims have followed the template of the communists. Back in the 1950s, many communists had front groups. The American Civil Liberties Union, started by Roger Baldwin, was a perfect example, and is a perfect example, of a communist front group. They were, Roger Baldwin was a known and avowed communist. He often wrote about wrapping himself and the followers of the ACLU and the leaders in flags and, and quoting the Constitution and quoting the Founding Fathers while they undermined America as communists. And so that is a front group. Well, many of the Muslim groups in America have followed the example of the Marxists of the 1950s, and now they're operating with many front groups. While I'm sitting here talking to you upstairs in our television studio all day today, we have had former FBI agent John Guandolo filming a, a new TV program that we're sponsoring here at WVW-TV. Uh, his co-host is Chris Gobbitz, who infiltrated CARE, spent uh, six months undercover posing as a convert to Islam. He grew the Sharia beard in the whole nine yards, came out with 12,000 pages and documents, which became the basis for the best-selling book, Muslim Mafia. So those guys have been here all day in our TV studio filming, uh, understanding the threat TV. And they will tell you of all the many front groups in America today for the Muslims, the Muslim Brotherhood. Muslim Brotherhood was started in, in uh, 
the Middle East, in Egypt, in the early 1900s. Muslim Brotherhood's leader was a guy named Albana. Albana and another Muslim Brotherhood leader by the name of uh, uh, Al Husseini worked closely with Adolf Hitler to create the final solution and the extermination of five million Jews. And so Muslim Brotherhood is here in America. Muslim Brotherhood has many front groups, just like the communists had many front groups, and to this day have many front groups. They have learned, the Marxists, from the communists to have front groups in order to keep the government officials, state officials, federal officials, law enforcement, FBI, confused. And so as the communists had front groups, so today do the Muslims. And one, uh, our long list of front groups from Muslim Brotherhood would be the Islamic Society of North America, would be the Muslim Student Association, which is on nearly 600 or more campuses in America. Every year they celebrate Hitler Week, where they honor Hitler on over 600 college campuses. Muslim Student Association is a front group for Muslim Brotherhood. So is CARE. CARE stands for the Council on American Islamic Relations. These are all front groups for Muslim Brotherhood. In 1987, Muslim Brotherhood founded Hamas. Hamas is the terror wing of Muslim Brotherhood. Hamas is now operating here in America. In the federal Holy Land trial, they document that ISNA and CARE are and NATE, the, uh, the North American Islamic Trust, NATE, all connected to Hamas, the federal government and their federal trial has admitted. These are all front groups for overthrowing our country. They've openly stated what their goal is, Sharia, Sharia law. Really, you should only say Sharia. Sharia means law. So when you say Sharia law, you're saying law, law. So it really should only be called Sharia. Sharia is about overthrowing our government. So as the communists and Marxists had front groups in the 1950s, the Muslims have learned from that, and now they have front groups. And they're all joined in their desire to overthrow America. And so now we have a red-green axis going on. The red of Marxism and the green of the Muslim Brotherhood flag for a red-green axis. And just as the communists were involved in an information operation, a propaganda war, so today are the Muslims involved in an information operation, a propaganda war. And most Americans today would not know socialism or communism if it played out in front of them because they've been brainwashed as to what these things are. In fact, they've been brainwashed to believe that redistribution of wealth is a good thing. Isn't that what Barack Obama said? The fundamental transformation of America, there needs to be some redistribution of wealth. Today, young people are all into social justice and some of the leading so-called evangelicals today are now into social justice. Matt Chandler of the Southern Baptist Convention, John Piper, a neo-Calvinist, Rick Warren, another Southern Baptist. Many of these people are pushing social justice, cultural transformation. And so even the evangelical world, in many regards, thinks socialism is a good thing. They just don't know it by the name of socialism because of information operations, propaganda wars, a false narrative. There's a saying that the supreme art of war is to subdue, subdue the enemy without fighting. The supreme art of war is to subdue the enemy without fighting. That has happened in America. The Marxists and the Muslims working together, first the Congress on their own, and the Muslims coming in here, watching and following the pattern of the, of the Marxists, they now have the same plan. Information, operation, propaganda war, subdue your enemies without having to fight them. And so they have subdued the American people into believing lies through an information operation. These tactics are nonviolent, but my friends, don't make, make no mistake. They create recruits that will practice violence. Information operation tactics are generally nonviolent, but they harvest through brainwashing recruits that are more than willing to practice violence. And you are going to increasingly see Christians, Jews, conservatives having 
violence perpetrated against them. Last week we talked about the Fabians, the Fabian socialists. They desire socialism by evolution, not revolution. They don't want to be involved in violence, but the Fabians, the globalists, internationalists, the statists are more than happy to let the communists, the Marxists, beat their thugs. And here in America today, what's another name for these communists? Antifa. How many of you knew that Antifa were the communists that were operating under that very name, Antifa, during the 1930s in, in Germany? That Hitler's brown shirts were fighting the communists known as Antifa or Antifa in the 1930s. The communists and the socialists were fighting each other. Antifa or Antifa is not new at all. It's just been re-harvested, and now we see it in America. What do we see? The violence. So you see an information operation in our schools is creating generation after generation of young people, and it is a nonviolent tactic, but it gives us recruits, gives them recruits that will practice violence. And the Fabians and the globalists and the internationalists are more than happy to allow this to happen. While they don't want to dirty their hands with it, they're more than happy because they know that the change comes from the conflict. You can't let a good crisis go to waste. Remember the earth was on fire if you went and looked up the Fabian window. And at the top it said what? Rebold it near to the heart's desire. The crisis is used to get the people to go where they would never go. <clears throat> Marxists and Muslims, in a lot of respects, are the junkyard dogs that the globalists have let off the leash so that they can have a protest movement. And the protest movement will pushes, it pushes the elected officials to where they otherwise may not go. In other words, if you can get a protest movement going, the politicians fear the protest movement and the politicians move to give the protest movement what they want so the protest movement stops their protesting, particularly stops their violence. These are mob tactics. And you watch, you watch as you see this increasing. Why is America collapsing. I, I want to give you four reasons why I think America is collapsing. One, no adherence to the rule of law. We now have judges making the law. We have the president of the United States, Donald Trump, at this time. He has the sworn duty to protect the country, to stop terrorists or known terrorists or people from terrorist countries coming in here. And yet look at how one Black robed thug after another stopped one executive order after another from what is clearly, according to legal experts who interpret the law correctly, have said is the right of the president. And yet one judge after another threw up a roadblock to that. You see, we don't have the adherence of the law today. We have postmodernism that says that truth and reality are created by man, not by God. We have legal positivism, which is a fancy word. It just simply means moral relativism applied to the law, legal positivism. As society evolves, morals evolve, and the law must evolve. That's what they believe. We have now the violation of the constitutional separation of powers, and now we have judges acting as though they are the legislative branch. And yet they're the not to be the legislative branch, they are to be the judicial branch. So we don't have an adherence to the law. Why has this been allowed to happen? Because people today don't know what is the purpose of government because of the information operation that has been going on since the 1930s by the communists. Two, there's no adherence to the purpose of government. What is the purpose of government? Romans 13 tells us, reward the righteous and punish the wicked, make a stable and just society. Security and protection. Respect for family and church government. You see, God created family government, church government, civil government. And when civil government does its job, then that allows family government and church government to operate in their spheres of influence, their areas of responsibility. But when there is no adherence to the purpose of government, there is not the stability for the family and the church enjoy the freedoms or be able to carry out effectively the responsibilities they have. Now we have government coming in and intervening on the family, intervening on religious liberty, 
on the churches. So one is no adherence to the rule of law. That's why we're collapsing as a nation. Two, there's no adherence to the purpose of government. Three, there's no adherence to inculcating the values of absolute truth, the source of freedoms, the purpose of government, the blessings of a free market capitalist system, and individual responsibility into the last several generations. Half of the country is on some kind of government handout or entitlement, and yet that is exactly fulfilling some of the mandates we find in the Communist Manifesto. The Communist Manifesto was written in 1948 by Karl Marx, the father of modern education. Karl Marx, by the way, if you go do a study on him, was an absolute bum. He lived off of his friend Engels' family's money, typical liberal, living off the money of others, bemoaning capitalism while he lived off, off capitalists. He had, I think he had six children, and two of them committed suicide, and two of them starved to death. He was so hated as an individual, only a few people showed up at his funeral. Well, Karl Marx wrote the Communist Manifesto, and, and pretty much all ten planks of the Communist Manifesto have been accomplished in America. Progressive education, excuse me, progressive income tax, the federalization of education, the federalization of land. And we could go right on through the ten planks of the Communist Manifesto and see that most of them have been accomplished right here in America through an information operation because American people have not been taught consistently what is the purpose of government, what is not the purpose of government, what is communism and socialism, what is it by any other name, and how does it destroy a nation? And four, we've not exposed the enemies of our American values. We've not exposed the enemies of our American values, the enemies of our American culture, and the enemies of the foundational American worldview of a constitutional republic. What is a constitutional republic? William Blackstone, one of the leading scholars of the Founding Fathers, said that a constitutional republic is whatever the divine is ruled on, we don't rule against. If the divine is ruled on it, we don't rule against it. Another way that we have made sure that we have not exposed the enemies of our culture is by making sure that our educational system upholds the enemies of our nation as heroes. I don't know how many of you are familiar with the Reese Commission. But many years ago, the Reese Commission, several decades ago, the Reese Commission did a study, a government study. And you know what they found? They found that communists and globalists were influencing writing and funding the textbooks being used by America's children. The Reese Commission. Many generations ago, this federal congressman, working with a few others, did a study and found that the communists and the globalists, the internationalists, were funding and writing the textbooks being used in our schools. Let me control the textbooks and I will control the nation. Isn't that what one person is dictators credited as having said? In addition to the Reese Commission, in the 1980s, Ronald Reagan commissioned a study of, of our educational system in America. You know what they concluded? In the early 1980s, mid 1980s, through a report called The Nation at Risk. The report declared that our educational system was in such bad shape that if another country did to our educational system what we have done ourselves, we would consider it an act of war. If another nation did to our educational system what we have done, we would consider it an act of war. A nation at risk. So these are the reasons, one reason why we see America is collapsing. You see, Americans don't understand that there is a revolution going on. Remember last week, we quoted Herbert Marcuse, who said that the old way of revolution is old-fashioned. We must now have a new way of revolution. In other words, no longer guns and bullets, but a new way of revolution, a diffused, the dispersed disintegration of the system. A destruction of the system economically through progressive income tax, milking the middle class, taking away their hard-earned money, that they don't have the capital to continue to grow their business or start a business or expand their business. So we will diffuse and disperse this integration, economically destroying the, situ the, the economic system. A diffused and dispersed disintegration of our educational system. A diffused and dispersed disintegration of the family and the definition of family and marriage through things like no-fault divorce. 
See, there's been a revolution in America. There's been a revolution in our educational system. There's been a revolution in the media. Go back and study the worldview of people like Walter Cronkite. Walter Cronkite was none other than a communist. Walter Cronkite exposed, exposed a communist worldview. In fact, many experts say the reason, one of the main reasons America lost the Vietnam War was because of the reporting of men like Walter Cronkite. Walter Cronkite, with an information operation and a communist worldview, bringing his worldview into the living rooms of the American people, falsely reporting information, helped to turn the hearts and minds of the American people against us winning the Vietnam War against the communists. And there's been a revolution since at least Walter Cronkite that continues to this day in media. But you see, I'm not shocked by that because when the Frankfurt School came to America in 1933, they said they would go after two institutions in order to have this revolution. One, education. Number two, media. They openly said we can't target all the areas, so let's target the two most influential, education and media. Education and media. And of course, we have the Rhodes Scholar Program. Rhodes Scholars by Cecil Rhodes, a man who was very wealthy in his De Beers uh, diamond mines. Cecil Rhodes had studied at Oxford under a man by the name of John Ruskin. John Ruskin died, I think it was in the 1920s, I want to say 1922 up top of my head, died before the rise of Adolf Hitler, and yet, why is this important? Because John Ruskin, who taught at Oxford and taught Cecil Rhodes, who started the Rhodes Scholarship Foundation that today puts young people through their globalist European system like George Stephanopoulos, like Bill Clinton, and the list goes on and on. John Ruskin, who mentored Cecil Rhodes, who died, and I think it was in 1922, had a swastika on his tombstone. Because you see, the swastika really, before it was known as the broken cross or black spider of Nazi Germany, was a, a, a New Age Indian occultic symbol, very popular symbol with a little variation, a little, very popular symbol in Hinduism. And that's why John Ruskin has, in the 1920s, what looks like a swastika on his tombstone. And he disciples at Oxford Cecil Rhodes. Cecil Rhodes then used his wealth to say, I want to send more young people through Oxford, and I want them to come up and, and appreciate the idea of a European system. And what was the goal of John Ruskin? What was the goal of Cecil Rhodes? Their goal was a world government based out of Europe. A world government based out of Europe. Folks, that is exactly what the Bible tells us is going to occur. Revelation 17 and 18 describes a world government out of Babylon, 58 miles south of Baghdad, described as that, 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 that city, that woman, the city of Babylon. That is a Eurocentric world government. Now, Cecil Rhodes wanted it in Great Britain. That's, I don't think that's where it's going to happen. But it will be Eurocentric. And so there was a revolution in the media through men like Cecil Rhodes and John Ruskin. John Ruskin, who discipled Cecil Rhodes, Cecil Rhodes uses his money to start Rhodes Scholarship. And what do you see? People being placed into media and education who come out of the Rhodes Scholarship Program, all being indoctrinated in the idea of a world governmental system out of Europe. A decreasing of America, a destruction of America, so that America is not the capitalist haven, but a European socialist system, a European-dominated world government. Go look at the worldview of George Stephanopoulos. Look at the worldview of Bill Clinton. Look at the worldview of Abu Battelle. Abu Battelle is a Muslim. Abu Battelle is a Rhodes Scholar. Abu Battelle runs the Interfaith Youth Corps, working with men like Rick Warren and others, promoting interfaith dialogue as a Muslim and a graduate of the Rhodes Scholar program. 
So any wonder that there's this revolution in education and media because those are always the two targets, education and media. By the way, you know who else sat under the teaching of John Ruskin along with Cecil Rhodes? Sidney Webb. Sidney Webb. You know who Sidney Webb is? Sidney Webb and his wife, Beatrice Webb, went on to help start the Fabian Socialist Society. The Fabian Socialist Society is what gave birth to the Labour Party. The Labour Party is where we get the Prime Minister of Great Britain, Tony Blair, from from a few years ago. Tony Blair has the Tony Blair Faith Foundation seeking to bring the religions of the world together as one. And so how did you get the Labour Party? From the Fabian Socialist Society. Who started the Fabian Socialist Society? Sidney Webb. Who mentored Sidney Webb? John Ruskin at Oxford, along with Cecil Rhodes. We've had a revolution in the military. Today we have transgenders. Trump has tried to stop this. Again, he's the commander in chief. He should have the right to stop it. The courts are saying no. And so we see transgender now being transgenders now being pushed into the military. You see, we are in many ways are living in a post-communist America. We in many ways we are living in a post communist America. Why do I say that? Because the communists of the 1930s and 40s and 50s never dreamed that the American people would agree to go as far as we have gone. The communists of the 30s and 40s and 50s never dreamed that the American people would sit still for this and allow for transgenders in our military, that we would put women in submarines, as we've now done under the Obama administration, putting women in submarines, something that was not done prior to the Obama administration. Putting women on the front line of combat, which is certainly the sign of a debased nation that does not value and protect the women of their nation. We now have open homosexuals in the military disrupting the order and discipline of the military. Sexual assaults of male-on-male -male sexual assaults are, they have skyrocketed in the military. Many of these men that come home suffering from post-traumatic stress syndrome, it's reported that many of them are, are, are in those conditions because they have been sexually assaulted by other men in the military. This is what the communists want because it destroys the fighting machine of the military that is for the purpose of securing a nation. And so the enemies have infiltrated the military, not only the communists, but now we see the Marks, the Muslims have infiltrated the military. A few years ago, one leading Muslim Brotherhood proponent who was able to visit the George W. White House and the Barack Obama White House, he, this Muslim Brotherhood, individual was allowed to handpick and certify the Muslim chaplains in the military, but not only the military, but also our federal prisons. Again, we not only have the communists that have infiltrated our military, now the Muslims have infiltrated our military. And how can you have someone swearing an oath to the Constitution that is in favor of Sharia, which is about overthrowing the constitutional republic? So we've had a revolution in education. We've had a revolution in media. We've had a revolution in the military. Most of this has occurred through the communist concept of an information operation, a propaganda war. We've seen a revolution in the national intelligence world. We had our last CIA, our one CIA directors under Obama, John Brennan, who spoke of jihad being a legitimate tactic of Islam. And it's said by national intelligence experts that John Brennan himself converted to Islam while stationed in Saudi Arabia several years ago. There has been a revolution in the courts, as we've already said, by not applying the law, but now, uh, but not by interpreting the law, but now rewriting the law. The law to be written by the legislative branch. Now the judicial branch is writing the laws. The judicial branch is only to interpret the law, the clear meaning of the law. But see, now we've got a revolution in the courts through legal positivism, situational ethics, as I've said. Society evolves, morals evolve, thus the law must evolve. 
what one generation will fight against the next accepts as values evolve. In the 1930s and 40s, people would have never accepted the idea of abortion, legalized abortion. Today, and since Roe v. Wade in the 70s, we have legalized abortion. Same thing with same-sex marriage. That would have never been accepted a few generations ago. We have a woman at this time sitting on the U.S. Supreme Court by the name of Ruth Bader Ginsburg. Ruth Bader Ginsburg in the 1970s was an attorney for the American Civil Liberties Union, and she argued for the courts to lower the sex age limit to age 12. Most Americans would never agree, or, or, or they would be horrified at the idea of lowering the sex age limit to age 12. You give it a few more years, and the majority of the American people will have no problem with the sex age limit being lowered to age 12. And yet we have a woman sitting on the U.S. Supreme Court who was, who was overwhelmingly approved by the U.S. Senate, even though she argued in the 70s as an attorney for the ACLU for the lowering of the sex age limit to age 12. We've had a revolution in the family courts through no-fault divorce. We've had a revolution in religion. And that now we have people that are well-respected and continue to receive respect who are espousing the communist, socialist worldview by other names. White privilege. Matt Chandler has spoken and promoted white privilege over and over again. And yet I can show you conferences of which Matt Chandler will be speaking once again this spring and sharing the platform with men like John MacArthur. Why on earth is John MacArthur sharing the platform with men like Matt Chandler? Or John Piper, who's also promoting Black Lives Matter. Black Lives Matter was founded by three communist women who called themselves, a, couple, a few of these three women, not only were they communists, they called themselves queer, openly called themselves queer. LGBTQ, queer. Now, when I was growing up, born in 1969, in the 1970s, we used to play a game in our neighborhood called Smear the Queer. And it wasn't a politically correct game, was it? And I can remember my parents saying, well, that's probably not a real nice thing to call it. And that was considered a derogatory term. If you called someone who was a man that was feminine or a homosexual a queer, that was considered an insult. Today, they celebrate the term queer. They celebrate it. LGBTQ. When I was growing up, if you said a woman looked awfully masculine, you might say she's so attempting to look masculine, you would say she looks awfully butch. Again, that was considered a derogatory term to say, well, she sure looks butch. But do you know today they embrace that term? It's now called butch and femme. You have a, a, a woman who is the male who's butch. And you have the woman who's fe the female who is feminine, and she's the femme. And now they openly celebrate that they are butch and femme. Folks, I can't keep up because the things that I used to get in trouble for saying are now the politically correct terms they want to be called. But don't you dare call Islam a religion of hate. See, there's been a revolution in religion. Now we have people like John Piper promoting Black Lives Matter, which is a communist movement. You have men like Matt Chandler promoting white privilege, which is part of the communist movement. White privilege is nothing more than anti-American, anti-Christian, anti-capitalist, anti-family. There's been a revolution in religion. There's been a revolution in economics, as we've already seen. And most of this has occurred through an information operation. I don't know how many of you are familiar with a man by the name of Rich Higgins. Well, Rich Higgins served on the National Security Council for President Obama until just a few months ago. In May of 2017, Rich Higgins wrote a about an eight or nine page report. It was an eight or nine page report written in May of 2017 to the President of the United States. It is said that President Trump read this and liked it. 
But it's also said that after it circulated around the West Wing, H.R. McMaster, the head of the National Security Council, who has said that Islam is a religion of peace, who has defended Islam backwards and forwards, H.R. McMaster, who's part of the swamp and needs to go, it is reported that H.R. McMaster got a copy of it, didn't like what he read, and fired Rich Higgins. What did Rich Higgins write about in this report? He was warning the president of the United States that his administration was under threat from the cultural Marxist. In my book, Grave Influence, that I wrote in 2008, that came out in 2009, that's what I wrote about, cultural Marxism and the Frankfurt School. And here he was in this report, written in 2017, warning the president of the United States about cultural Marxism, and he named the Frankfurt School. He went on to warn about the globalist, the globalist within the Republican establishment. He went on to warn about groups and their rights based on sex or ethnicity, which was a direct assault on the very idea of individual human rights and the natural law around which the Constitution was founded. He warned the president of the United States of Islamophobia. I know you're familiar with that term Islamophobia. How many of you know that the term Islamophobia was really created in the early 1990s? Do you know who created the term Islamophobia? It's a term that was coined by the International Institute of Islamic Thought. The International Institute of Islamic Thought coined the phrase in the early 1990s, Islamophobia. What's the purpose of that phrase? It is to stop any criticism of Islam through an information operation, a propaganda war. And so Islamophobia, the term was born. And here is Rich Higgins warning Donald Trump about the term Islamophobia being used to shut down those speaking truth about Islam. Former International Institute of Islamic Thought member is Abdur Raham Mohammed, who was with that organization, International Institute of Islamic Thought, when the word was created. He has since rejected the worldview of the International Institute of Islamic Thought he went on to say this, quote, this loathsome term is nothing more than a thought terminating cliche conceived in the bowels of Muslim think tanks for the purpose of beating down critics, end quote. Information operation. Stop the criticism. He went on, which Higgins did, to warn the President of the United States about the corporatists. Corporatists would be those who are merging socialism with capitalism, big government and big business, corporate fascism. He went on to warn about Islam, Islam and he went on to warn about Fabian socialism. The very things I told you about last week and this week. Here's a man who was on the National Security Council with some of the highest security clearances, warning the president in this eight or nine page report, the very things I've been trying to tell you guys about last week, this week, and that I was writing my books about since the 1990s. And he specifically mentioned Fabian socialism. He went on to mention Antonio Gramsci. Antonio Gramsci was a communist in Mussolini's Italy. Antonio Gramsci tried to tell Mussolini, um, this is not how you have a lasting revolution at the end of a gun. You must change their worldview. You must change their worldview through information operations and, and education and media. You change their worldview. Fascist Mussolini did not like this. and threw communist Gramsci in prison where he eventually died. But he did a lot of writing while he was in prison and before he went to prison. And the Frankfurt School that came to America in 1933 studied a lot of the writings of Antonio Gramsci. In this report, Rich Higgins warns the president about the Hegelian dialectic process. The Hegelian dialectic process comes from George Hegel. It's something that Karl Marx also studied and appreciated. 
the concept of the Hegelian dialectic process is something I write about in my book, Grave Influence. It came out in 19, or 2009. And the Hegelian dialectic process goes on every day as part of this cultural revolution, as part of this information operation. And remember Karl Marx and the Communist Manifesto loved the idea of the Hegelian dialectic process. It basically says this, thesis and antithesis, idea, opposite idea. And those ideas must fight until they merge or synthesize and become one. We see this going on in every area of life, particularly in the area of economics and religion and law. In the area of economics, it's socialism and capitalism, socialism and capitalism, and they fight, fight, fight until they merge together, and it's a mixture of both for what is called Fabian socialism or communitarianism or internationalism or statism or fascism, corporate fascism, same things. Today, you have the Republicans that will offer up a piece of legislation, legislation A. This is what the conservatives or the Republicans are offering. The Democrats come along with option B, and A and B fight each other nonstop. And then out steps John McCain, Republican, Chuck Schumer, Democrat, and they have option C, which is a little bit of both, A and B. And everyone runs to option C because everybody gets a little something. Without the dog and pony show of A and B fighting each other, no one would have ever agreed to go to C. C was always going to be the plan. C was always the end game. A and B had to fight each other in order to synthesize and merge together for compromise and group consensus to get C. And yet the ball is moved down the field and the process starts all over again. In the area of law, in the area of economics, socialism, capitalism merging together for a mixture of both. In the area of religion, we see this going on, Christianity and Mormonism. People running around, oh, Glenn Beck, he's a Christian. Can't tell you how many people said that a few years ago. Oh, Glenn Beck, he's a baby Christian, yet he's a blatant New Age Mormon. But they're merging Christianity and Mormonism. They're merging now Christianity and Islam for what is called Chrislam. They're merging New Age and Christianity for a new spirituality. So in religion, this is going on. This is the Hegelian dialectic process. And yet here was Rich Higgins warning the President of the United States about the Hegelian dialectic process. Last week, I told you about Herbert Marcuse. And this week, I told you again, the one who said that we must do away with the old way of revolution. The new way is to diffuse this first disintegration of the system. Well, in 1966, as I alluded to, uh, 1965, as I alluded to last week, Herbert Marcuse actually said, Liberating tolerance, then, would mean intolerance against movements from the right and toleration of movements from the left. As to the scope of this tolerance and intolerance, it would extend to the stage of action as well as discussion and propaganda, of deed as well as word. He went on to say that in order to have tolerance, you must have intolerance. You must be intolerant of those that promote tolerance. In other words, you must be intolerant of those who promote absolute truth. For absolute truth is intolerant. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. That is not tolerant. That is not inclusive. That is exclusive. And so he said to have true tolerance, we must be intolerant. He went on to say, that they must withdraw toleration of speech and assembly from groups and movements which promote aggressive policies, armament, chauvinism, discrimination on the group, uh, discrimination on the grounds of race and religion, or which oppose the extension of public services, social security, Medicare, etc. In other words, he says we must deprive conservatives who are for a strong military, those who are for limited government, those who oppose socialism and a welfare state and the expansion of entitlements. We must deprive those people of freedom of speech and freedom of assembly, intolerant for those they deem to be intolerant. And yet this is exactly what Richard 
Higgins is quoting to the president of the United States. And what happened for him doing this? He was fired. My friends, let me just reiterate again. He is warning about cultural Marxism, Antonio Gramsci, Islamophobia, the corporatist, the globalist, the Frankfurt School, Fabian Socialism, Antonio Gramsci, the Hegelian dialectic process, the intolerance toward Christians and conservatives, a police state, and what happened to him? He was fired by H.R. McMaster. It said that Donald Trump was very unhappy, but instead of hiring him back, Richard Higgins and firing H.R. McMaster, H.R. McMaster was allowed to stay. One of the people, by the way, who's promoted this idea of thesis and antithesis, idea opposite, idea converging and mixing, was a lady by the name of Dorothy Day. Dorothy Day ran a group of communist newspapers, but she was the one that really kind of coined the phrase communitarianism, the mixture of socialism with capitalism. And now part of this information operation includes the Muslims using interfaith dialogue. Interfaith dialogue. The idea that evangelicals should sit down and have an interfaith dialogue with Jew-hating, Holocaust-denying, Hitler-defending, Holocaust-denying, as I said, imams like Yasser Qadi, from right here in Memphis, Tennessee. And that, that's exactly what James White, the great apologist, the great Christian apologist, James White, that's what he did. He brought himself from Arizona to Memphis, Tennessee last year and did an interfaith dialogue with a Jew-hating, Holocaust-denying, Hitler-defending, jihadi-preaching imam whose mosque is three miles down the road. A man who is, who is admitted being mentored by a known terrorist and mentoring known terrorists. A man who last year brought a, a Saad Raj Wahaj to his mosque to speak. So Raj Wahaj is an unindicted co-conspirator of the bombing of the World Trade Center in 1993. He is openly called for using the knife for jihad against the Europeans, the Canadians, and the Americans. Yasser Qadi has spoken with and for groups known and connected not only Muslim Brotherhood, but also Hamas and other terrorist groups. Last year, the nonprofit charity, the nonprofit uh, government, the agency, the government agency in Great Britain that oversees nonprofits, the government agency in Great Britain that oversees nonprofits was asking some of the nonprofits in Great Britain, why are you bringing this imam from Memphis to Great Britain? Don't you know who he is? Why are you bringing him here? Let me tell you something. The secular government of Great Britain is aware of the dangers of this imam more than the leading so-called apologist within evangelicalism that is a hero to these crazy charismatics, or excuse me, crazy Calvinists, neo-Calvinists, who bring him into their conferences. Some of them being neo-Calvinists, some of them being more traditional Calvinists. But they've defended him and given him a pass simply because he's a Calvinist. In fact, we have one man on video saying, well, if Rick Warren did that, we would be uncomfortable. But since James White has a long track record, we need to get, and he preaches the doctrines of grace, code word for Calvinism, we need to give him a pass. He admitted we wouldn't give Rick Warren a pass, but we're going to give him a pass because he's a Calvinist. Now, folks, I'm not a Calvinist. You can probably tell. But I'm not an Arminian either. I believe in what the Bible teaches. I'm a Biblicist. The Bible teaches that we were chosen before the foundation of the earth. The Bible teaches that no one seeks after God. And so, yet I believe the Bible is clear on election and predestination. But did you know the Bible also says in Matthew chapter 11, Come, come, all ye who are weary and heavy laden, come. We see in the, in the Gospel of John that same tension between Election and man's responsibility. That is what is referred to as the doctrine of confluence or the doctrine of concurrence. They're both true. They come together like two streams that flow together and become one. We can't fully understand it in our human mind. And the problem is you have the Arminians on one side and the Calvinists on the other, and they're both off in the ditch. 
And the truth is right down the biblical middle. It's an antinomy, an apparent contradiction, but they're both true. Who lives your Christian life? Not I who lives, but Christ who lives in me, right? Who lives your Christian life? I buffet my body. They're both true. Was Jesus a man? Yes. Was he God? Yes. Both true. Did men write the word of God? Yes. But God wrote the word of God as he moved upon those men. They're both true. See, the Bible is filled with these apparent contradictions that are not a contradiction. But yet we have today these people that have worshipped their man-made religious system over the Bible, and now even so-called conservative Calvinists are giving a pass to a man by the name of James White sitting in interfaith dialogue with a Jew-hating, Holocaust-denying, Hitler-defending, jihadi-preaching imam in interfaith dialogue. And James White tells him what? On video, you'll find on YouTube, he says that you, Yasser Qadi, are my mentor on this part of Islam. Why would any Christian apologist want to be mentored on Islam by a Jew-hating, Holocaust-denying, Hitler-defending, jihadi-preaching imam? He says he senses a kindred spirit with him. Why would you want to sense a kindred spirit with the things of Satan? Why would you even seek common ground with those things of Baal? 2 Corinthians 6.14 says you cannot do this. What fellowship does the righteousness have with unrighteousness or light with darkness or the things of God with the things of Baal? 2 John 9-11 through says don't give a greeting of spiritual solidarity to the false teacher lest you partake in his evil deeds. The Ephesians 5.11 says it has nothing to do with the unfruitful works of darkness but rather expose it. Romans 16.17 says mark those who cause divisions doctrinally and avoid them. And yet here is James White praised by some of the so-called most conservative Calvinists in America defending him this past year when he took place in an interfaith dialogue with what are men I know in law enforcement and retired FBI, one of them who's in my house tonight, who as law enforcement for the FBI were tracking men like, not just tracking men like Cotty, they were tracking Yasser Cotty himself. And now the information operation comes into evangelicalism through the Muslims and their interfaith dialogue. Oh, we can all get along. We can learn from each other. We can find common ground. And yet there sat Yasser Qadi bemoaning the resurrection of Christ, the crucifixion, the Bible. And there was not refuting of that by this so-called great apologist, James White. Go watch it yourself. It's on YouTube. You can watch four one hour TV shows we did on it with a former Muslim, now Pastor Sharam Hadian, and a former Egyptian who speaks Arabic, Usama Daktaf. We did four one hours on this and played clips from this interfaith dialogue, and then these men commented as experts. You can watch all four hours for free at wvwtv.com. But now we have the information operation of interfaith dialogue. In closing, listen to this. This comes from a guy named C.L. Siyed Katub. Siyed Katub was part of the Muslim Brotherhood. Remember, the Muslim Brotherhood started in the early 1900s by Albana, worked directly with Hitler for the creation of the Final Solution and the murder of 5 million Jews. And Siyed Katub of the Muslim Brotherhood said this about interfaith dialogue. The chasm between Islam... And the society of the unbelievers is great, and a bridge is not to be built across it so that people on the two sides may mix with each other, but only that the people of the society of unbelievers may come over to Islam, end quote. My friends, the Muslim Brotherhood has made it clear that their number one tactic for infiltrating communities and law enforcement and churches and stopping the criticism of Islam is interfaith dialogue. And yet this information operation has now come inside evangelicalism. And now interfaith dialogue is even being embraced, not by the, just the mainline liberal churches, but even by so-called conservative wing of evangelicalism and defending of James White. You see, there's revolution going on in all the areas, the institutions that I mentioned at the beginning. And in many ways... The Muslims have watched what the Marxists have done 
with their front groups and their information operation and their political correctness and they're following a template that has been created for them. And now the Marxists and Muslims have joined forces together for a red green axis, the red of Marxism and the green of the Muslim Brotherhood flag. The red of the Marxists and the green of the Muslim Brotherhood flag creates the red green axis to bring down our shared enemy, they say, of America, the great Satan that supports the next in line sake, little Satan, Israel. And my friends, I believe it's very, very possible that the reason we don't see America listed in the end times is because this Marxist and Muslim coalition has come against America. Even tonight, and I'm gonna have to close, but even tonight, and you go on our radio, or on our website, wvwtv.com, and find a whole hour on this, there is now evidence that we have the Club K cargo containers coming into the U.S. They look like rail cars or box cars or what you see on the back of a flatbed semi, but the top opens up with a command from a satellite and up pops four silos for shooting off cruise missiles. There's reason to believe that they have now made their way into and are already pre-positioned in the United States of America. When I did a program on this, someone listened to it and told someone inside an international company. Someone with that international company emailed me repeatedly over a month, said, we listen to your show. We work out of the Middle East within the Gulf and we track ships. And they gave detailed information on the ports, the ships, and the port of entry here in the U.S. where they believe they watched a Club K container come into the U.S. I turned that information over to a friend of mine who's with the uh, National Intelligence Agency and had 600 men that answered to him. He didn't even know about the Club K car until we started covering it. You say, well, how can a guy in National Intelligence not know that? Well, the guys in National Intelligence specialize. And they are so overwhelmed right now and are playing catch up after eight years of National Intelligence agencies being absolutely destroyed by Obama and the eight years the enemies have had to prepare the battlefield right here in America. And did you know that just a few months ago when Uranium One went through, the agency, the government agency that was to stop that was shut down reportedly by James R. Clapper when that government agency was shut down that allowed Uranium One deal to go through that supposedly benefited the Clintons and the Clinton Foundation and gave about 20% of our uranium to Russia. Do you know that that was the same time something else went through that very very few people are talking about? And that is a contract was given, a 35-year lease was given to Fort Canaveral in Florida to a doctor, a doctor, Jaffer, who was the head of Saddam Hussein's nuclear program. He was Saddam Hussein's nuclear scientist. He was on the kill list during Operation Iraqi Freedom. And our government has given a 35-year lease to Dr. Jaffer of, of Port Canaveral in the cargo container terminal. And his company is in a direct business relationship with 100% Russian-owned exporter of the Club K cargo missile system. Do you think the communists and the Marxists might have us over a barrel? Certainly if they've brought in cargo containers. They can lay dormant for 10 years and then get commands from a satellite. And if you think this is all conspiracy, you need to go and you need to read the full report that was put out by this, a 91-page report put out by the Center for Security Policy called The Perfect Storm. And on my website at WVWTV, you will see where I interviewed for 30 minutes former CIA officer, operations officer Claire Lopez on this. How many of you know that Venezuela is going through a financial crisis because of years and years of communism, socialism, Marxism, and the middle class are eating out of dumpsters? But did you know that the Venezuelan, the Venezuelan uh, gas station here in the United States is known as Sidco? Well, Sidco was in such bad shape not too long ago. Sidco, the Venezuelan government, and their owned, their Sidco is owned by Venezuela, they went to Russia for a loan. They got several billion dollars, 2.8 billion 
from Russia to back up their bonds. And in return, they got about a 50% stake in the Sidco oil business of Venezuela. Now, Sidco owns about 14,000 independent operated gas stations here in the U.S. I'm not worried about those 14,000 gas stations. But what you should worry about is that the Venezuelan government, now with Russia owning about 50%, they, Venezuela and Russia now own, they now own three oil refineries in the U.S., one in northern Illinois, one in Louisiana, one in Texas, and then they also own about 48 oil terminals. So you now have three refineries and 48 oil terminals, most of them up and down the eastern seaboard, owned by Russia and Venezuela. The CIA director Pompeo said to Chris Wallace a few weeks ago this past summer that Venezuela has now been in close working relationship with to the point that Iran, Russia, and Hezbollah, that's your Muslims, Iran, Muslims, Hezbollah, Muslims, Russia are now all operating in Venezuela. That's the Muslims and Marxists. And now Russia and Venezuela own three oil terminals together and uh, three oil refineries and 48 oil terminals, most of them up and down the eastern seaboard. How would that be for placing some of these cargo container systems with the four cruise missiles that can be launched off the commands of a satellite? And by the way, we have two North Korean satellites circling the globe coming over top of the U.S. several times a day. And Dr. Peter Pry, who was the chief of staff of the EMP Commission for Congress and who we gave a radio show to at worldviewradio.com, has said that there's better than 50% chance that one or both of those satellites from North Korea circling the globe coming over the U.S. has a nuclear weapon on for the EMP. But what's the point? The point is there may be a reason why America is not listed in the last days. And if a coalition of Marxist and Muslim nations, as we see in Ezekiel 38, come together and they move against Israel, what would be the first thing that Muslim Marxist coalition should do before they move against Israel? Bring down America, uh, America the biggest offender of Israel. Bring down the biggest offender of Israel first, America, then attack Israel. But we know that God supernaturally intervenes and destroys the enemies of Israel, and it takes over six months to bury the dead of their enemies inside their borders. The Bible says this happens so that the Lord will know that he is God. But my friends, I believe that there indeed is a revolution in America. And part of it is divine judgment as God has given over our nation per Romans 1. But in the meantime, we have to try to understand the times and know what God would have us to do that we might occupy till he returns. This isn't doom and gloom, it's just facts. It is what it is. But we have to know how to operate and live and think in the midst of a perverse generation. And that's what we do at Worldview Week, seeking to apply a biblical worldview to law and science and economics and history and family and social issues and religion so that we might protect and defend the church. In closing, do what Paul warned about in Acts chapter 20 weep. Weep. Watch and warn. And in fact, the order is watch, warn, and weep. That's what we started out with last week, Acts chapter 20. That's where I'll conclude. May we be people that watch, that warn, and that weep. Let's pray. Our gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you for those who have joined tonight, whether in person in the Houston area or online, because they desire to understand the times and know how we should respond. May we understand the worldview wars that are raging and the answers that are found in your word. And may we realize that the information operation is not only taking place within education and media and law and in the military and national intelligence, but also within some of the biggest evangelical organizations and ministries in America. And we must warn of those men who have risen from within, ungodly men who've crept in unnoticed, Jude 3. May we be people who understand the times and know how you would have us to respond as our ultimate goal is to guard the church whom you gave your life for. And we thank you that you've given us a sure word of prophecy and you've told us what will happen. And you've even told us in Matthew 24 not to worry and foretell you these things will happen. Don't worry. 
So you don't have a spirit of fear and of weakness, but of sound mind, knowing that these things have been providentially, prophetically predicted to occur, and they reveal the supernatural nature of your word. And just as you are with Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, as they walk through the fire, standing with you and for you, we know you will provide us with your angels to give charge over us and your Holy Spirit to keep us, that we can walk through the fire of the soft persecution and the ever-increasing persecution that may turn from soft to hard. And may we with great anticipation say, even so, Lord Jesus, quickly come and night shall be no more. To your honor and glory we pray, Jesus Christ, amen. Well, thank